the earth is round There's proof abound Don't fool around The date does sound The earth is round Like an apple or a melon Being sailed by brave Magellan Yet you ask, is this all true? What the hell, what's wrong with you? Like a snowball or a beat It spins through space, it's really sweet Your lack of science is quite right Goodness gracious, get a life Round, 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 the earth is round Smart people found that the earth is round There's proof abound, don't fool around The date does sound, the earth is round Like an apple or a melon Being sailed by brave Magellan Yet you ask, is this all true? What the hell, what's wrong with you? Like a snowball or a beat it spins through space it's really sweet your lack of science is quite right goodness gracious get a light round 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 the earth is round smart people found that the earth is round there's proof abound don't fool around the date does sound the earth is round like an apple or a melon being sailed by brave Magellan Yet you ask, is this all true? What the hell, what's wrong with you? Like a snowball or a beat It spins through space, it's really sweet Your lack of science is quite right Goodness gracious, get a light Round, 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 the earth is round Smart people found that the earth is round There's proof abound, don't fool around The date does sound, the earth is round Like an apple or a melon Being sailed by brave Magellan Yet you ask, is this all true? What the hell, what's wrong with you? Like a snowball or a beat it spins through space it's really sweet your lack of science is quite right goodness gracious get a light round 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 the earth is round smart people found that the earth is round there's proof abound don't fool around the date does sound the earth is round like an apple or a melon being sailed by brave Magellan Yet you ask, is this all true? What the hell, what's wrong with you? Like a snowball or a beat It spins through space, it's really sweet Your lack of science is quite right Goodness gracious, get a light Round, 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 the earth is round Smart people found that the earth is round There's proof abound, don't fool around The date does sound, the earth is round Like an apple or a melon Being sailed by brave Magellan Yet you ask, is this all true? What the hell, what's wrong with you? Like a snowball or a beat it spins through space it's really sweet your lack of science is quite right goodness gracious get a light round 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 the earth is round smart people found that the earth is round there's proof abound don't fool around the date does sound the earth is round like an apple or a melon being sailed by brave Magellan Yet you ask, is this all true? What the hell, what's wrong with you? Like a snowball or a beat It spins through space, it's really sweet Your lack of science is quite right Goodness gracious, get a light Round, 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 the earth is round Smart people found that the earth is round There's proof abound, don't fool around The date does sound, the earth is round Like an apple or a melon Being sailed by brave Magellan Yet you ask, is this all true? What the hell, what's wrong with you? Like a snowball
Hello, evening all. Thanks for joining me. And welcome to the third uh, lecture uh, on introduction to astronomy. Um, today we're talking all about the solar system. A uh, couple of bits before we start though. Um, again, I must stress this is a, a beginner's guide to astronomy. So if there's anything you might already know, then um, obviously you know if you if you know a lot more if you know a lot about this already you might know a lot of the stuff on here um secondly uh, i think i think this is the hundredth video the hundred public video so um i was going to do something different for the hundredth video but as it's tonight then that's fine it's a live stream anyway um but i might do something else on top uh, like a little bonus video in the week or uh next weekend we'll see but yeah 100 videos Whee! right let's go thank you in advance to all the moderators um I see we've got a few in the chat already <clears throat> okay so week three um month three sorry uh, and we as I said we're talking about the solar system today uh, so we're concentrating on stuff that uh, is relatively close astronomically speaking okay the first thing we need to do is watch a short video um, it doesn't work uh, on this so I'm just going to play it this way now this video is um, it's kind of a compilation video and it was from uh, an interview from Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, for Time magazine and they interviewed him and they asked him a question some of you may or may not have seen this they asked him a question um, what is the most astounding fact that you know about the universe and this was his answer what is the most okay, astounding the fact you can share with us about the universe sound, let me know the most astounding fact. The most astounding fact. Is the knowledge that the atoms that comprise life on Earth, the atoms that make up the human body, are traceable to the crucibles that cooked light elements into heavy elements in their core under extreme temperatures and pressures. These stars the high mass ones among them, went unstable in their later years. They collapsed and then exploded, scattering their enriched guts across the galaxy. Guts made of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and all the fundamental ingredients of life itself. These ingredients become part of gas clouds that condense, collapse, form the next generation of solar systems, stars with orbiting planets. And those planets now have the ingredients for life itself. So that when I look up at the night sky, and I know that yes, we are part of this universe, we are in this universe, but perhaps more important than both of those facts is that the universe is in us. When I reflect on that fact, I look up, many people feel small because they're small and the universe is big, but I feel big because my atoms came from those stars. There's a level of connectivity. That's really what you want in life. You want to feel connected. You want to feel relevant. You want to feel like a, you're a participant in the goings on of activities and events around you. That's precisely what we are just by being alive. So I'll cut it a little bit short there, but I think you can agree it's a pretty humbling video. But 
someone asked in the comments there quickly the name of the song. I think it's called To Build a Home. I can't remember the name of the artist at the moment though. Um, so what Neil deGrasse Tyson was talking about there uh, was essentially how solar systems are created. So he's talking about how um, the nuclear fusion inside large stars create a lot of the elements, a lot of the lighter elements, and the heavy elements are created, or the heavier elements are created during the supernova explosions. And that essentially gives all the ingredients for life, scatters it across space, and solar systems form from that. So this is essentially what Neil deGrasse Tyson was talking about, which is how not just our solar system, but many other solar systems form. Okay, but let's focus on our solar system. And we're going to start with the Sun. Now, the Sun is actually a pretty ordinary star in the grand scheme of things. Um, very run-of-the-mill, very average, not very big, not very bright, not very hot. Obviously hot to you and I, but in the grand scheme of things and other stars it's not. So it's a main sequence star, so it's on something that we call the main sequence. Essentially it's in the middle of its life. Um, and it's known to be in a group called Yellow Dwarfs. Um, just checking, is that is that working? It's not, is it? I wonder why that's not working. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, that's a bit. Doesn't happen before. I may have to do it um, like this. But that's fine. Um, so, as I was saying, it's a main sequence star that is known to be in a group called Yellow Dwarfs. It's about four and a half billion years old. Um, it has a radius of 700,000 kilometers. Um, and it produces energy through nuclear fusion of hydrogen to helium. Uh, it's a little bit more complex than that, than just hydrogen to helium. There's a, a few more... Um, reactions going on, but essentially hydrogen becomes helium at the core of the sun. So if we have a quick look about some of the features of the sun, so we've got the photosphere here. Now the photosphere is pretty much what we would call this, the surface of the sun, if we could call it the surface. And the chromosphere is what we would call the, like the lower atmosphere. The corona we would call the upper atmosphere. The corona is the thing you can see um, during uh, an eclipse. So it's that kind of, often you see it, it's like a white, these white rays coming out from behind the moon. And inside the sun, we've got obviously the core. Now the core is about 15 million degrees. Outside of that core, we've got something known as the radiative zone. Then we've got a convection zone above that. And then we've got the surface and the surface is give or take about 6,000 degrees. We also notice uh, things happening on the surface of the sun. Um, and some of those are sunspots. So there's like a dark area, the temperature is a bit lower than 6,000 degrees. Um, we believe they're related to magnetic fields. But we've also got things like prominences, flares. There's a lot of activity going on on the surface of the sun. And it can have a great impact on, on uh, life here on Earth. Anyone who's seen the Northern or Southern Lights can vouch for that. Okay, what about the planets then? So the, the planets are obviously, um, we are obviously part of that, and there are eight of them. Now in 2006, the International Astronomical Union defined a planet as an object that one, orbits the Sun, two, has sufficient mass to be round, three is not a satellite of another object and four can clear the area around its orbit. Now the problem with um, Pluto, 
So when Pluto was downgraded from a planet to a dwarf planet, is this fourth one here. It couldn't clear the area around its own orbit, and we'll look into that in a bit more detail in a bit. So I'm fairly sure a lot of you are happy with the order of the planets in the solar system. So we have obviously Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars. We've got an asteroid belt. Then we've got the gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. Now, in this particular drawing here, the planets are to scale. The size of the planets are to scale. But the, um, the distances obviously aren't. And they're nowhere near that close. Okay, so this is uh, an astronomy course, so we need to know how we're going to view these planets. And depending on what planet we're talking about, we need to look at where their orbits are in relation to ours. So this blue line here represents our orbit. Now, Mercury and Venus are planets that have orbits inside ours, so they're close to the Sun. And we call those inferior planets, so they're the inferior orbits. And the best time to see these planets are at either greater, greatest eastern elongation or greatest western elongation. And obviously we can't see them when they are the other side of the sun. And if you're lucky enough, you get to see a transit of Mercury or Venus uh, crossing the face of the sun, if you're lucky enough. Very rare occurrence. Then we have the planets that are outside of our orbit. Um, so obviously we're talking Mars. Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. And they are superior planets, so they have a superior orbit. And the best time to see those are when they are at what we call opposition. So they're basically, we are in between, directly in between the Sun and that planet. It's the closest point to us in its orbit. Uh, the, the full face of the planet is lit and you can see really, really good images through um, telescope and binoculars. So let's start with the smallest planet and the closest one to the Sun, Mercury. So Mercury is the smallest planet, as I said, um, and closest to the Sun and has an orbital period of 88 days. So 88 days to go around the Sun. It's got very little atmosphere, hardly anything at all. So the surface temperature is extremely volatile. You've got really high maximums and really low minimums. So when it faces the sun, and this, when you're on the surf, if, if you're on the surface and you're facing the sun, the temperature can be as high as 427 degrees. But away from the sun, if you're on the night side of Mercury, that can drop to minus 173. So we're talking a real big swing here. It's a 600 degree swing between in the day, in the light, in the daylight and in the nighttime side of Mercury. It also has the most eccentric orbit in the solar system. Uh, I'm just going to try and present it again quickly to see if it works. So when I say it's got the most eccentric orbit in the solar system, um, it basically has the least circular orbit. So it's, it's the furthest from a perfect circle uh, of all the planets in the solar system. That's what I mean. I'm just going to quickly check to see if this works or not. No, it's not working. Okay. Right. Okay. Let's move on to Venus. So Venus is often referred to as Earth twin, but the two planets couldn't be more different. And one of the main reasons for that is CO2. So the level of CO2 in the atmosphere of Venus is at 96.5%. So 96.5% of the atmosphere of Venus consists of carbon dioxide. Now if you put that in a bit of context, the level of carbon dioxide here in the atmosphere on Earth is about 0.04%, so much lower. Now these levels of carbon dioxide trap huge amounts of heat which essentially causes a runaway greenhouse effect. As such, there is a constant global temperature on Venus of about 460 degrees, day or night. As well as that, so as well as contending with that extreme high temperature, 
you've also got to contend with a high pressure. The pressure on Venus is about 90 times that of Earth's and it'd be the equivalent of living about a kilometre below the surface of the ocean here on Earth. So it's not the best place to go and we certainly wouldn't want to visit Venus ourselves. Much too hot, pressure's way too high. Now Venus has got an orbital period of 225 Earth days, so it takes 225 days to orbit the Sun. So that would equate to one year on the surface of Venus. However, it takes 243 days, 243 Earth days, to make one complete rotation on its axis. So that means that a day on Venus is longer than a year. And you would have to contest with long periods of daylight and long periods of darkness. It's a very, very strange place indeed. The only thing that's similar to Earth is the size. It's almost as big as Earth, a tiny bit smaller. Okay, so what about viewing Mercury and Venus? So Mercury is next at greatest western elongation on the 11th of April this year. So if you look east just before sunrise, you'll get your best view of Mercury. Now that's not to say that you don't see Mercury at any other time of the year, but this will be your best chance of seeing it when it's at its brightest. Now Venus is next at kind of a, a good viewing point when it's at its greatest eastern elongation, which is the 24th of March next year. So then you just look west just after sunset, you'll see a really bright You'd think it was a really bright star, but it's not. It is, in actual fact, Venus. And because obviously they lie closer to the sun than us, we can only see them either shortly after sunset or just before sunrise. Now, when they're either directly behind or directly in front of the sun, then obviously we can't see them, apart from obviously where I said there's a transit. And apart from the sun and moon, Venus is actually the brightest object in the sky. Um way brighter than the brightest star, for example. Okay, let's move on to the moon. I'm I'm a bit I'm a bit miffed about the 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 presenting not working because obviously everything's gonna be there all at once and it doesn't come in. But hey, we'll have to work with it. It's fine. So um the moon is obviously something that uh, we all look at and we all kind of wonder about how it's got there. We look at the surface features on the moon um, and there's a few that might be worth um, looking at or might be worth knowing. So we've got the Sea of Serenity. So let, I mean, obviously the Sea of Tranquility is the big one. Um, everyone knows that from the Apollo missions. But next door to that, you've got the Sea of Serenity. The other side, you've got the Sea of Fertility. Down here, this larger crater is Tycho Crater, uh, which obviously is named after Tycho Brahe, if you remember uh, the first episode where we talked about the history of astronomy. And then the other larger crater is named after Copernicus, Copernicus Crater. Uh, this really large uh, sea on this side is called the Ocean of Storms, and then the one next to that is called the Sea of Rain. These are the most prominent features on the surface of the Moon. Now, why do we ever see only ever see one face of the Moon? Well, this is something called synchronous rotation. So essentially, the Moon takes pretty much exactly the same amount of time to orbit us as it does to rotate on its axis. And because of that, you're always going to have one face that's facing facing us. Now, the moon was formed about 30 to 50 million years after the formation of the solar system. And the following video I'm about to show is the most plausible theory we have to date on how it was formed. So give me a second and we'll run that one.
Okay, so obviously that bit at the end there was um, sped up dramatically. Uh, it, it didn't coalesce that quickly. But as I said, um, that is the most plausible theory we have to date as to why uh, or how the moon was formed. Now, there's a few. There's a few. Uh, there's a few theories. So one is that the moon formed with the Earth. Um, the problem with that is is that the moon's density is lower than the Earth, so it's unlikely that they kind of formed at the same time. Another theory is that the moon could be captured by uh, Earth's gravity. But again, normally if, when that happens, the moon is much smaller than uh, our moon is. So at the moment, this is our, our best bit of reasoning as to how the moon was formed. Okay, right. Um, let's move on to uh, my favourite, uh, which is Mars. So, Mars is a fascinating planet, uh, in my opinion. It's got an orbital period of just under two Earth years. It's got a thin atmosphere of carbon dioxide and has temperatures that can reach as high as minus five in the sunlight. But it's also home to the highest mountain in the solar system, and it's an extinct volcano called Olympus Mons. So here we've got a little uh, little diagram here. So we've got Everest here at 8,848 meters, and then Olympus Mons over 21 kilometers high. It is huge. Obviously, I can't uh, talk about Mars without mentioning the rovers. We had a little salute to Opportunity the other day. Um, this picture up here is a uh, the first ever selfie taken by a Mars rover from Curiosity. Uh, for all you Tim Foilers out there, I believe the arm was photoshopped out. Um, so yeah, this one here is a uh, sunset on Mars. And believe it or not, there is a pixel or possibly two here uh, that is Earth. So this is a picture of Earth from Mars. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so best time to view Mars. So Mars is next at opposition on October the 13th next year. Now, as again, that doesn't necessarily mean this is the only time you can see it. In the months leading up to that and the months after that, you'll still be able to get, be able to get a good view of Mars. But when we're talking about Mars and viewing it opposition, we're talking about viewing it almost twice as large in a telescope viewfinder as other times, um, enough to even see the ice caps. So Mars is a, is a fantastic planet to view when it's at opposition because uh, it is so much closer to us. Okay, now in between um, Mars and the gas giants is the asteroid belt and there are millions, hundreds of millions of asteroids in this belt. Now most of them range in size from pebbles to large cars but there's about 200 asteroids that we know of that are larger than 100 kilometers so they are kind of continent killers and about a million that we know of that are about a kilometre or more in diameter. So they're modest country killers. Um, gravitational influences can obviously move asteroids out of the belt, uh, which send them flying across the solar system. Now, you might notice from the diagram here that there are what we call some Trojan asteroids here. And Jupiter has such a large influence in terms of its mass and its gravitational pull and its gravitational influence that it literally pushes and pulls these asteroids around its orbit and it also kind of helps protect the inner solar system so that the mass of Jupiter is kind of like a, a guard so in the early solar system it was probably responsible for a lot of activity in terms of asteroids um, we call it the heavy bombardment but now it does a good job of kind of protecting the inner solar system. Uh, and as you can see, there's those Trojan asteroids on its orbit. Now Ceres is an object that is in the asteroid belt and it was originally thought of to be 
uh, an asteroid and it accounts for over one-third of the mass of the entire belt. It was discovered in 1801, uh, thought it was a planet. In 1850 it was reclassified as an asteroid and then the good old astronomical um, union reclassified it in 2006 to give it dwarf planet status as they did with Pluto. Right, uh, what any coffee left? I have. Let's move on to the gas giants. That's the inner solar system. Um, let's move on to uh, the gas giants, so Jupiter. Jupiter is the king of the planets. Uh, it is almost two and a half times the mass of all the other planets combined. And it's also got the shortest day in the solar system. It rotates on its axis once every 10 hours. And the great red spot here is a storm that has been raging for over 350 years. I believe it would swallow up three or four Earths, this uh, great red spot, this storm. Um, so not pleasant at all. So what about viewing Jupiter? So Jupiter... Um, is next to opposition on the 10th of June this year. So soon you'll be able to start seeing Jupiter uh, a little bit more prominently and on the 10th of June it will be perfect as, as long as you've got good weather of course, perfect viewing for Jupiter. Um, and you can also see the four Galilean moons. Now we talked a little bit in the first lecture about the Galileo moons, how Galileo um, noticed that they were rotating around Jupiter, how they were orbiting Jupiter. So we're going to have a little look at some of these moons. And the first one is called Ganymede. So Ganymede here, um, there's, there's 60, well, I say 67 moons. The number's always going up because we're always discovering more. So when I did this, uh, PowerPoint it was at 67 probably gone up now but the four largest are those that were discovered by Galileo in the 1600s like we talked about in the first lecture and the largest one is Ganymede and this is actually so big Ganymede that it is bigger than the planet Mercury now remember at the beginning when we said what's classified as a planet it's obviously got a sufficient mass to be round but it does not orbit the Sun kind of on its own accord it orbits another body that is orbiting the Sun. So because of that we can't classify it as a planet. It is basically a satellite of another planet. So it is a large moon, bigger than Mercury. It's got a very thin atmosphere that does appear to contain some oxygen. Next one is Europa. Now Europa is the smallest of the four Galileo moons and it's very slightly smaller than our own but it is much more interesting. It's the smoothest body in the solar system. It's got a very young and active crust, which comprises mainly of a frozen salt water ocean. Now, some experts believe that actually, at depth, that frozen salt water ocean has melted, and it's kind of like a slushy salt water ocean. And it covers the entire moon. And there's so much water on Europa that if you gathered it all together into a drop or a large ball, there would be more water on Europa than there is on Earth. So it is an incredibly interesting moon. Obviously, where there's water, there is huge potential for life. So it is definitely something that we could possibly look at as a species in the future. Next up is Callisto. So Callisto is the furthest away of the four Galilean moons from Jupiter and it is the most heavily cratered body in the solar system. It's been highlighted as a possible human base for exploration of the Jovian system with a possible 2040 mission date. However, uh, the administration has changed slightly in America, um, possibly now that isn't going to happen, but if we're going further than Mars, I would certainly expect the, the Galileo moons to be the next step after Mars. 
Io. Io is the last one. So it's also the closest of the Galilean moons and the second smallest. What's interesting about Io, it is the most volcanically active body in the solar system. So you, you know, we, we live here on Earth and, and we know of um, earthquakes and volcanoes going on all the time. And you would think that we are the most volcanically active body in the solar system. But no, Io is the most volcanically active body in the solar system. However, not through the same processes. Earth's volcanism is through the primordial heat. The core is still hot. There is still a lot going on under the surface. Io's volcanic activity is due to something slightly different. Now Io, because it's so close to Jupiter, it, it's heavily influenced by its gravity. And every time Io orbits Jupiter and lines up with the other Galilean moons, it gets a little kick. And what that effectively does is it pushes and pull, pulls Io. It, it kind of, you could argue that it's a sort of tidal effect. And it actually manipulates the the rock, the the rock and I, and it and it manipulates it so much that the friction causes heat, and that heat is the process that causes this volcanicity on I. Okay, any one time there's 400 active volcanoes erupting. Uh, on Io and conditions are very similar to that of the early Earth with obviously the exception that the volcanoes on Io emit primarily sulphur dioxide. This is a picture of a volcano erupting on Io. Okay, let's move on to Saturn. So two photos of Saturn here. The one on the right is uh, taken by Cassini. Um, I believe when I read about this that Cassini kind of by chance was behind Saturn with the sun directly behind it and it's kind of took a picture of the sun's rays going through coming through the rings. It's quite beautiful. So Saturn is the furthest planet that we can see with the naked eye. It takes almost 30 years to complete one orbit of the sun. Like Jupiter, it consists of hydrogen, which acts very weird under pressure. We call it metallic hydrogen. Um, it's very, very odd, very difficult to explain because obviously the pressure we experience here on Earth is nothing compared to the pressures in these gas giants. The ring system of Saturn extends over 120,000 kilometers from the planet, but in places can only be, possibly only be 20 meters thick. So what about viewing Saturn? Saturn is next to opposition in July this year. So we've got Jupiter in June and Saturn in July. It's gonna be a great summer for viewing uh, these planets. Um, 9th of July for Saturn. Again, you'll see some beautiful, beautiful things for a telescope. You'll be able to certainly make out the rings and certainly some moons as well. It's well worth looking at. Saturn and Jupiter. So let's have a, a little, we had a little peek at the some of the moons of Jupiter. So let's have a look at some of the moons of Saturn. And the largest one is a moon called Titan and it's extremely interesting Titan. It's got a very thick atmosphere and that atmosphere consists primarily of nitrogen. It's about 95% nitrogen, about 5% methane. It's got a constant surface temperature of minus 170 degrees, and it is a prime candidate for non-Earth-like life in the solar system. Now, Titan actually has weather, and rather than water, it's liquid methane, and it regularly rains methane, causing huge methane lakes to form. Okay. Enceladus. Enceladus is extremely interesting. It's the sixth largest moon of Saturn and it orbits once every 1.7 days, which is very, very quick. The most extraordinary thing about Enceladus is that it is cryovolcanic. So basically there are ice volcanoes, ice geysers going off all the time. There are many of those and they send icy particles out from beneath the surface, which actually feeds an entire ring. So this is a picture taken by Cassini of, of Enceladus. 
that is literally spewing out material that feeds an entire ring around Saturn. It's extremely interesting in Saturnus. Okay. okay, let's move on to Uranus. So Uranus is the seventh planet from the Sun, but it can't be seen with the naked eye. It was the first planet to be discovered by the use of a telescope by William Herschel in 1781. The interesting thing about Uranus is its axis is set at 98 degrees, which means one pole is continually facing the Sun. So as it orbits the Sun, one pole is facing it continuously. It takes a huge 84 years for Uranus to complete an entire orbit. And small fact, if you have a pub quizzing, all of the 27 moons of Uranus are named after Shakespearean characters. Outside of Uranus is Neptune. So Neptune has an orbital period of a colossal 165 years. And it orbits at an average distance from the Sun of 4.5 billion kilometers. It's believed that Neptune, Neptune was once closer to the Sun, but migrated to its current position now. Um, the weather is the is the interesting thing about Neptune. It, Neptune, it's extremely volatile. It has wind speeds of up to 600 meters per second. Now, here on Earth, the wind speeds reach nowhere near that. Eight, like I think it's about 50 or 60 meters per second maximum here on Earth. Okay, outside of uh, Neptune, we have, obviously apart from Ceres, which is in the asteroid belt, we have the dwarf planets. I'm um, going back to that point uh, that we said before on the from the International Astronomical Union about what is classed as a planet. The problem with Pluto was it can't clear its own orbit because it is there is so much stuff. You'll, we'll talk about it in a minute. There's so much stuff out there in the outer solar system. More dwarf planets, ice, uh, other asteroids, loads of stuff. And it can't clear its own orbit. And that was the issue that uh, the International Astron Astronomical Union had. So they downgraded it to a dwarf planet. As I said, it was declassified in 06. It's got five moons. Eris is the second largest dwarf planet, but is the most massive. So there's more mass, but its diameter is smaller than Pluto's. And Hormier is the least spherical and has a huge 285 year orbit. So we're now starting to think or look at the fact that the solar system isn't all about the planetary region. There's a lot more going on outside of that. Now, Pluto's orbit is a little bit weird. So when the solar system would have formed, everything would have formed on the same plane. So the sun, uh, the Sun would have formed, there would have been a lot of material that was orbiting the Sun and a lot of that coalesced to form um, these planetesimals which eventually form planets and because of the way the gravitational pull works it would have all formed on the same plane and and that's how that's how most of the solar system is all the planets are on the same plane however Pluto's orbit is off by quite a way and that leads us to believe that potentially Pluto was captured by the Sun. So Pluto could easily have been coming past the solar system. I mean, I'm obviously generalizing here, but coming past the solar system one day and the, the Sun's gravitational influence was enough to capture Pluto because we wouldn't normally see a planet doing that if it formed with the solar system that it was in. Now, outside of the uh, planetary region, we have something called the Kuiper Belt. And this is a region just beyond the orbit of Pluto that contains comets, more dwarf planets, asteroids, chunks of ice, huge amount of material. And it's huge. And straight after that is something we call the Oort Cloud. Now the Oort cloud is an extended shell of icy objects that literally surrounds the solar system. So you could almost say that the solar system is in like a bubble of these icy objects that surround it. Now, if 
you take a quick look at this um, diagram, the planetary region here, so this, this axis is in, is in astronomical, unit, um, astronomical units, remembering that one AU is the distance between the Sun and Earth. So the planetary region is about 10 astronomical units. If we extend all the way out to the edge of the Earth or cloud, we're talking 100,000 astronomical units. So again, the planetary region of the solar system is barely scratching the surface of the whole influence of the Sun. So we've got this planetary region, then we've got the Kuiper belt beyond that, and beyond that we have the Oort cloud. It's, estimate there's, it's estimated there's around 2 trillion objects. Now, don't ask me how they come up with that number, but that's the estimate for the amount of objects in this Oort cloud. But it's thought to be the origin of a lot of the longer period comets that we sometimes see entering the inner solar system. And it sits at a distance of around one light year from the Sun. So you can see this influence that the Sun is having over such a vast amount of space, such a vast distance. Even at this 100,000 astronomical units, the Sun is still having an influence. Right, okay, that about wraps up um, the third lecture. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. The main thing about this lecture was just familiarising yourself a little bit more with what the solar system consists of, when we can see some certain objects. And next month, so the fourth lecture, we're looking at things that are... So we're, we're kind of going outside the solar system. So we're looking at a much kind of deep sky viewing, so a deep sky tour. We'll be looking at uh, a little bit more on the hardware side of it, so the telescopes and the binoculars, um, how kind of some of those work, plus a few kind of recommendations if you want to get started yourself. So that's all to come next month. Um, thank you all very much. How many have we got? Almost 800. Brilliant. Um, thank you all very much for watching. Um, I will see you all on Tuesday, where I'll be having a stab at um, ruining astrology, star signs, horoscopes, all of that. So join me then on Tuesday for that. Um, and then Friday is the Patreon voted video winner. Yes, I did it in one go. Um, so Friday is the is the video that the Patreon guys voted for. Um, so that's it. Thanks very much. Um, and I'll see you all on Tuesday. Bye-bye.